Well, it is now after school, so let's go ahead and finish this lecture. All right, here is where I left off earlier, so 5.4 part two. Ooh, it's the sequel. Okay, so um, on that previous slide, we were talking about analogous and homologous structures and the reason why those two things uh, would come about. So convergent and divergent evolution, again, those are on the previous slide. Uh, but anytime we see like that common, that right, that common pressure, um, like like living in the water, um, that do not share a common ancestor, that is convergent. When we see them sharing a common ancestor, right, they came from the same place and now they're becoming different, even though the structures are the same, that is divergent. Okay, so here's that next slide on convergent, right? So it's it's independent of common characteristics, right? That means that it's completely separate. Again, like they share, hold on, I don't, you don't need to see all my crazy tabs. Here we go. They share, oh, you're kidding me. Oh my gosh. Let's see, go to slide eight. Oh, not 18. Well, here we go. You're just gonna, my goodness. <laughs> you see the same, there we go. Shared environments cause structural similarities to evolve. Um, and what this does, so why, why this is the convergent evolution, is it limits how viable uh, the design of our cladograms are, right? Because if we're basing them off of similar structures, it doesn't necessarily mean they have a common ancestor, right? So um, here's a, a good example. So convergent, they look similar. So a dolphin's a mammal, right? So mammals share common ancestors. So these two are actually more closely related, right? Because of like different characteristics we talked about, like the structures, the breathing, right? The, how they give birth to young, even though these two look similar, um, but are very different, right? The common pressure here would be that they live in the water, right? They need these things to be able to get around the fins. Um, however, they are not, right? They do not share that common ancestor. Okay, so now let's look at more exciting molecular evidence, Whew, right? Molecules, smaller. Um, and so we talked about how technology has come along. We've been able to use amino acid chains and protein sequences um, and DNA to look at uh, common ancestors, right? And so what we have seen, um, what we talked about like is a, a couple lectures ago is that oftentimes variation comes because of mutations, right? So we have a random mutation like to not produce the tusk, the tusk like elephant. We have a mutation to have that darker pigmented um, like the moth and... Okay. If you are I can't even pause it right now. I'm sorry. There you go. So over time, all those mutations accumulate and they're passed on and we see them in sequences. Okay. So going back to when I'm comparing those two DNA strands, remember you were looking at that a couple slides ago. Um, as we see more differences, right? So the more differences suggest that more time has passed since the, the two diverged, right? Which is pretty... I want to say that that makes sense. So the, the more, the longer ago they diverge, the more differences in their DNA they have. The fewer differences we have, the more closely they are related. Okay, so you saw that in the last part um, with that, looking for the differences in that, uh, in that chart there. Okay, we know now because of um, technology that molecular evidence, it's just more reliable, right? Because sometimes structures don't always suggest common ancestors. Um, and we use it a lot more in finding the phylogenic trees and the relationships um, than we used to, right? Okay, all right, here's some different types of molecular evidence, right? So you need to know why it's more important or why it works better. Um, but when we use molecular evidence, uh, they compare, again, the DNA and then amino acids. I know uh, this is something that's a long time ago, but remember that amino acid sequences are, are proteins, right? And that certain portions of your DNA code to make amino acids that come together to make proteins, right? And if they're in the same order, then you're going to get those same amino acids made. So when we're looking at those, we do those two things, their DNA or their amino acid sequence, whichever one is more available, right? So non-coding DNA, oh, sorry, um, Actually mutates the fastest because it doesn't. There's no displayed change, uh, and it doesn't. Uh, so we call it kind of the introns or the part that do not code 
for any type of protein function. And so when mutations happen in those, they can continue to be passed on because there's nothing, you can't see anything from it, right? There's no protein that's made. Um, the gene sequences, they mutate at a, a slower rate because they do alter protein structures. Right, so the proteins could be melanin. It could be, you know, your blood. Other proteins do everything, everything in your body. So if there's a change in a protein, um, then you're going to see, a, especially if it's a not not a good change. Um, looking at a Tay-Sachs disease, right? There's an enzyme that's not made that breaks down fat in your brain. Just one single base being off, it changes. The, that that enzyme is not made, it's a deadly disease, right? So if, when those things happen, we see that they're not passed on very, um, I'm gonna say that's passed on a slower rate because oftentimes they're not good for survival, okay? The amino acids mutate at the slowest rate because of codons. So, so if we're going from like fast to slick, so we have the introns that do not code for DNA, you've got gene sequences, and then you have amino acid. Because if you rewind your brain actually back to, um, I'm actually gonna go like this. Do you remember looking at the um, uh, codon charts? In biology, right? Do you remember these fancy things? But as you can see, and make this one bigger, right? So um, this base pair, G, C, G, G, C, A, all these code for the same amino acid, right? So if there's a random, um, we call them a silent mutation that occurs there, we don't see a change. So this is gonna be the last, uh, the slowest, as if it's a, a mutation um, in the amino acid. These would be the base pairs, okay? All right, move on. There we go, all the tabs. Okay, all right. Oh my gosh, Mrs. Myers, I just can't. We're just gonna go here, we're running out of time. Whew. Okay, so when we compare DNA sequences, uh, the conservation of gene sequences, um, we look at this versus, uh, oh my gosh, hold on. Okay, it should be fixed. Okay, so how do we compare DNA sequences, right? There's actually um, a process called DNA, DNA hybridization, hybridization big fancy words um, to basically look at. So every time we um, to remember that your DNA molecules are held together by the hydrogen bonds, which are pretty weak bonds. And that's, um, that's, that's good that they're weak because remember that your DNA is constantly, um, uh, sorry, breaking apart to be read and then being put back together with the hydrogen bonds, right? And so when we break those bonds apart to break those hydrogens, heat is actually used between complementary base pairs. So we can actually calculate the amount of heat that is used to separate the strands and then compare the two, right? So the the, um, the amount of heat, right? The, the, this right here, the high TM, right? So the more similar are the sequences, the higher the temperature is gonna be required. Um, and then the less similar they are, they have lower temperatures, right? So you can see here, it says species A and B are related because there's a high temperature that took to, to take apart the two strands. Um, and then B and C are not because it has the lower, the lower rate. Okay. All right. Another piece of evidence is mitochondrial DNA. This is different than DNA. Um, we call it MT DRNA. It is not MR, M, um, that's not to be confused with mRNA, which is messenger RNA. This is MT DNA, make sure you circle that or something that gets commonly confused. This is mitochondrial DNA. Remember that you have this organelle, the mitochondria, um, and it has uh, its own DNA, and you only inherit this from your mother, the maternal. There's a direct lineage from mother on. So you can look at this one right here, the maternal, right? So nuclear DNA is shared with all ancestors. It's passed on in this, but your um, your mitochondrial DNA is only passed on from the, um, the female side. Okay, and the reason that is, um, is it does not go under meiotic recombination, right? So remember in meiosis, we get the independent assortment, we get, gosh, it's a bunch of review, we get the, um, uh, the law of segregation, and it does not recombine, right? It stays in check and has more copies in larger amounts and high, has a higher um, mutation rate because it's not like protected right there, right? So this makes looking at mitochondrial DNA um, really good for looking at species to see how far or recently they've diverged because it has a more direct lineage, right? So we care, we usually compare these like within species, like what they call haplogroups, right? So half groups, right? So mitochondrial DNA is another piece of evidence that we use to make these um, things, these things, <laughs> these clatter counts. All right, another piece, the last piece is molecular clocks. Um, Molecular clocks are looking at, oh, again, a fun graph here, uh, how the sequences accumulate, uh, or looking that some sequences are, come at a constant rate, 
right? So we see like, for example, every 1 million years, right? And scientists can calculate how much time has gone in between those divergence by looking at the number of mutations. So if we say that these mutations happen at a constant rate, then I can look at the number of mutations and calculate how much time has gone back. This is called a molecular clock, okay? Different genes um, may, may change at different rates. Um, and and that, that also can be um, calculated into it. So again, you see this like looking at the beta chain of hemoglobin, right? So you're looking at man, dog, bird, and fish, and you're looking at the similarities between the two and the differences, right? So you're comparing one to the other. This is, again, looking at the molecular clock and knowing how long it takes for a mutation and then figuring out how many years ago um, the two may have diverged. Okay, so based on all that information, sometimes we get to reclassify. We're going to look at an example in the next uh, slide, um, but there's a couple different reasons why we reclassify. Most of the time it's based on that DNA or the molecular DNA or the mitochondrial um, uh, DNA that we just talked about, right? Um, and that's just more information coming to us so that we have more evidence, right? So not just based on structures. Okay, um, entire groups of species are some to, or have been recently like just separated based on new evidence. The example we're going to look at in your book, I'll briefly show it to you here, is called the figwort. Um, and because of DNA um, uh, data, we have we have classified it to two different species, right? Um, different species were grouped into shared taxon due to common ancestry, right? So, and we talked about this with humans, where actually the hominin was actually created to include gorillas because they found out there's more in common than with the orangutan and the chimpanzee. Okay. All right. So this is the figwort example. We are going to look at this example in class. So you can just kind of just scan it right now. Um, but looking at the chloroplast DNA, so right, the DNA that's in chloroplast, they were actually able to uh, figwort, the type of flower, right, um, make this into this used to be the figwort family and they were reclassified. They took two of them out because of the evidence in the DNA. Okay, and here is it for the hominid. This is the humans, right? This is how it used to be, the hominid, right? The pan, the gorilla, and this is the new based on the DNA evidence that we have um, uh, there. Okay, so here is the topic review from the both the lectures, right? So going back to part one, before I was called into sub and the chaos, you've got clads and phylogeny. Make sure you know those two things or have those two things. Um, how do we construct cladograms? We'll talk about that in class, but make sure you have it in your notes. Analogous and homologous traits and structures have been mentioned multiple times now, so we need to make sure that we understand those. Convergent and divergent evolution, um, molecular evidence, whether that's DNA, mitochondrial, or the molecular clock, how the molecular clock works, and um, examples of reclassification. Again, we're going to look at more of those in class. Okay, this concludes part two of 5.4. Uh, again, come to class with any uh, with any questions that you have. We'll be doing some practice, um, but that that concludes our unit five, our topic five. Yay! All right, guys, I will see you soon. Have a fabulous day.